Thank you so much. All right. Well, let's open our Bibles, if you would, please. <clears throat> and we're in the book of Nehemiah tonight. Shortest person in the Bible, Nehemiah. <laughs> get it later. All right. Thursday night. I know it's been a long week, hasn't it? I cannot get over it. The beautiful music tonight. If that's all we heard were the specials and the choir and the congregationals and went home, I've been blessed. And thank you, choir, for all the preparation and the special groups and, and our instrumentalists tonight and and just what a joy. And thank you people for making it on a Thursday night. Sometimes you can come because the pastor browbeats you and he says, I'm going to call your name out Sunday if you're not here. Or he can just say, we ought to come because we love the Lord. And so someone said, if you come the first night, it's because you love the preacher. If you come the second night, it's because you love God. And so we'll find out who loves God tomorrow night. And... Uh, it's kind of like most pastors say, they say, I got them here the first night, you got to get them here the second night. Now, if you have a choice of coming tonight or coming tomorrow night, tomorrow night's the night you want to be here. That's, that's the night you want to be here. You really do. So don't miss tomorrow night. And uh, what a blessing. Now, is there a meal tomorrow night too? Wow. So, so what's on the uh, meal? Leftovers from tonight? Leftovers from tonight? <laughs> Spaghetti. Spaghetti. And uh, so that'll be a great, great time. I'm born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm not Cajun, but I am from the South. And uh, God somehow saw it fit to move us to California 25 years ago. Who has been to California at some time? And that's why you live in Washington, okay? <laughs> and uh, first bumper sticker I saw when I moved to California, it said, Welcome to California, now go home. <laughs> and I felt like saying, I would be glad to. And so uh, we're known for two things there in Napa Valley. One, we have more wineries than any city, I believe, in the world, a county, with 360. And then we also have the largest mental institution <laughs> in the state of California. I thought I recognized a few of you tonight when I walked in. And so oftentimes I'll just tell people we're known for winos and weirdos. And uh, we also uh, uh, produce the communion wine for most of the Baptist churches. And so if you've ever been here for a communion service, we probably provided it, especially if it was real liquor. Now, many years ago, we just used grape juice, and I found out our offerings were not growing, so we decided to switch to the real wine. And instead of those little cheapy cups, we've gone to the 32-ounce cups, and now we have communion Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Off, buildings are paid off. It's just a great idea for stewardship, and so maybe that will help you as well. And uh, we're, we're just excited about what the Lord's doing there. We have first-generation Christians in our church. It's not like Texas. It's not the Bible Belt, and I know you know that out here. Uh, our, our biggest selling item in our church bookstore is those $5 gift Bibles. That's the biggest selling item we have. And many folks are purchasing their first Bibles they've ever owned. They're age 30, they're age 40, they're excited to have those $5 Bibles, and they're saying, man, I got a Bible. Their parents never went to church, their grandparents never went to church, and when we sing Amazing Grace, they're saying, boy, that's a good song. When did they write that? Uh, 300 years ago. And it's exciting. It's exciting. I hope it never wears off on you. I hope you never get used to the Christian life. And it looks like many of you, it's fresh and it's, and it's sweet. I'll give you one story. We're in Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8. I've got a suitcase that I carry and thank God for wheels on suitcases. How come they didn't invent those 40 years ago? You remember carrying them? And so, so I had my, my luggage. I was getting off the plane in Sacramento one, one, I think it was a Wednesday. I was heading to my car. I had all the books and tapes that didn't sell. I had my luggage in the other hand. I had two suitcases. And as I came closer, are we good on this? Brother Fort, we good on this? And as I came closer to the car, I noticed something moving behind my car. It was on the ground. I looked close, and it must have been a baby because it was about this long, and it had a rattle in the tail. It was a snake, and it was right behind my car. And I looked at it, and I said, man, I'm going around the other direction. And then I said, no. It's a rattlesnake, and there's going to be some innocent lady walk to her car and is going to get bit and get killed. It's going to be my fault. And I'm just thinking, I said, Lord, I don't have my sling. I do not have my rod. And then I thought of that verse, what is in thine hand? 
And I thought, two suitcases. <laughs> and so I look over here at this snake, and I said, well, here it goes, man. And so I took that first suitcase, and I just tried to wheel over his body. And as, I, uh, I, as the wheels hit him, he kind of reared up the strike, and I, I wheeled over him with the other suitcase, and he rolled away and tried to get away, and I, 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 I hit him again, hit him on the head this time, made him very angry. He's, he's twirling and trying to strike, and then I went into that lawnmower mode. I just started doing this, just, just kind of like that, and he kept rolling and rolling, and, and finally he stopped rolling. And I got to thinking, where is my wife to see me now? I have killed a rattlesnake with my own two suitcases. And as I'm kind of, you know, wait, uh, uh, rejoicing, I look over and there's a small crowd gathered. And with all the automobiles, they never saw the snake. They just saw this gray-haired guy having a, a great time with his suitcases and just all excited. No wonder people think us Christians are a little bit odd. Because sometimes we are. And so we're in the book of Nehemiah. If I had one message to bring to a church it would probably be this one. Because after I'm long gone and you forget me and maybe forget the text, hopefully you'll remember the truth tonight because it'll last a long, long time. Notice the verse, please. If you're able, let's stand in honor of God's word. I'll just read one verse in Nehemiah chapter 8. And here's the background. Nehemiah is a layman. He's not a pastor. He's not a paid staff member. He's not a deacon as far as we know. He's not a prophet. He's a layman that left a great job. He was the food taster for the king. What a job. Would you like to taste this lobster? I would be glad to. How about the filet mignon? Is it cooked good? No, a little bit more. Worcestershire sauce on it. And, and uh, what a job. He left it to go back to his hometown, Jerusalem, to build a wall so God would get the glory. He knew if a wall was built... The children of Israel would feel secure. They'd come back in, worship God, build houses, and stay in their country, and revival would come. So after 52 miraculous days and fighting the enemy, they finished the job. By the way, don't quit too soon. It's always too soon to quit. You'll never meet a happy quitter. I've never knocked on the door of a person and they said, I used to go to church, and I'm so glad I'm not in church anymore. It's wonderful since we're out of church. I've never met anyone like that. I've never met someone who said, I used to be married. I'm so glad I'm not. I, I just, you don't meet happy quitters. No matter what they quit, whether they quit high school or they quit, uh, you just don't meet them. And so he finished the job and notice what he said. Are we okay, Brother Four? I can barely hear this here. I just don't want to strip a gear for tomorrow. Is it my jacket's in the way? My, too many muscles. It's, it's kind of muting the, we're all right? You can hear, oh, okay, all right. If you mess me up, I'll be after you. I mean it. We won't be just friends. Okay. So Nehemiah, let's look at this. We'll get right into the message. We've got, I think, 10 minutes, the pastor said. <laughs> Nehemiah 8, verse number 10. Then he said unto them, they're having a, a, a potluck or a Baptist buffet. He says, go your way. Eat the fat. Notice, folks, that's a command. <laughs> For you Atkins people. South Beach diet people, locale people, you are breaking the Old Testament. And then here it is, and drink the sweet, you diet Pepsi drinkers, <laughs> diet Coke drinkers. He says, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord, neither be ye sorry. Now here's the part of the verse, we've all heard it. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Let's say that together, just that phrase. Would you please? For the joy of the Lord is your strength. And then notice it comes from God, the joy of the Lord. But notice what he compares it to, our strength. That's where we will get our strength. Strength for the journey comes from joy. Don't even try to make it without joy. Father, bless now the brief time we have tonight. We're just on the other side of the curtain of eternity. We don't know if it'll start tomorrow with the trumpet sounding. We don't know if we'll drop dead this week. Life is so uncertain. We don't know if this will be the last revival meeting this church will ever host. It could be soon. I pray that you would help us finish strong. 
Help something that is said tonight keep us in the race and in the battle. Encourage the discouraged. Give tools to the one that doesn't have much in their tool chest tonight. Thank for the privilege of representing you. Give me undivided attention tonight. Help my attention be to you as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Sometimes we pastors will hear statements like this in the office when we're counseling. They'll say, Pastor, my husband has left me for another woman. I don't have an education. I'll be raising the kids by myself. I heard this one recently. Pastor, I have never met my dad. He has been deported to Mexico. I will never get to meet my dad. I've heard this one. My husband just left me. The police are looking for him. We got into an argument and uh, pushing and shoving. There was some blood and some hair pulled. And now, Pastor, I don't want to press charges. He'll go back to jail and I'll never see him again. Here's one. Pastor, we've been off drugs for years. And I found a bag of dope in the drawer today. You know, sometimes I just don't know what to tell people. You know, that, that sort of thing, Pastor, they just don't teach us in Bible college. Pastor, I'm getting married soon. and We thought it good to have a blood test to just make sure from our wild days we don't have a disease. And I found out I've got AIDS. Sometimes I look at people and I don't even know what to tell them. Now, when I was 21, I knew just what to tell them. Well, here's what you do, brother. Now I'm 54 and got a little bit of sense. Oftentimes I'll just say, you know, I don't even know what to tell you. You're going to have to get along with God, get with this book. But I will say this, don't even try to make it without joy. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. People search for it in drugs. They search for it in alcohol. They try to find it in money. Here's our country. I believe they said one out of 10 people played the lottery last week. One out of 10 people in our country, $649 million, whatever it was. Some of you doing this right now. I know I tried. I was trying to, <laughs> trying to, trying to send the pastor on a vacation. I meant well. And uh, I was only going to keep $219 million of my uh, share. But uh, 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 people are looking for joy and money. Uh, it's called the happy hour at the nightclubs. They join a gang. Uh, uh, Whitney Houston was looking for it. Michael Jackson was looking for it. Uh, many famous, uh, Tiger Woods still searching for it. Many folks are lurk, uh, 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 looking for something that's going to last, and they've just not found it. It was Solomon, who was the wisest man in the world at one time, wrote three books of the Bible, had a thousand women. The queen of Sheba came to see him, had wisdom. He wrote songs, he spoke, he was wise. Yet the Bible says, after he had built a house that took 20 years to build, 13 years, and, and the temple, he said, therefore, I hated life. He says, life is vanity, it's empty. Someone says, well, I'm a happy person. Happiness comes from without. Joy comes from above and from within. Happiness is what you possess. Joy is who possesses you. I remember the story years ago. This, uh, this woman had a parakeet, and his name was Chippy. True story. And she was trying to change Chippy's cage. And you know how birds make a mess, and they have newspaper, and they just pull it out. She decided to save time. She stuck a vacuum cleaner hose inside of the cage and decided to suck up all of the debris. Well, when she stuck the hose in, the telephone rang, a landline at that time. When she picked it up, the hose went up and Chippy disappeared. She finished her phone call and at the end she goes, where's Chippy? And she checked the vacuum cleaner, opened it up, pulled open the bag and there's Chippy. Dust, debris, trash all over his feathers. He looked so messed up. She goes, he's so dirty. And she stuck him under the faucet and turned the faucet on and uh, rinsed Chippy off. He looked like little Woodstock bird in the cartoon, you know, his feathers like that. And she says, he's going to die of pneumonia. So she took a blow dryer and began blow drying Chippy. And his feathers finally dried off and he looked so in disarray. She put Chippy back in the cage. Miraculously, he lived. But he never sang again. <laughs> They said he would just stare out of the cage blankly. You ever feel like Chippy? 
The old world just sucks you in and, and the devil drenches you with temptation and then the flesh just blow dries you and you're stuck in the cage and everyone says, sing to us, sing to us. And you say, you don't know what I'm going through. Yet the Jews said, we hanged our harps on the willows in Babylon. And they said, why don't you sing us the songs of Zion? How can we sing the songs of Zion when we're going through trials? Only if we have joy. That's how you do it. I found this years ago. If you wait to serve God when you have no problems, you'll never serve God. It's joy that gives you strength to get through those times. No joy is like being a carpenter without a hammer, a soldier without a rifle, an athlete without a coach and a trainer, and a church without a Bible. It just cannot happen. We sing the songs in our children's church. I don't know if y'all uh, sing these songs. I've got the joy, 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 joy. And then you hit those deep notes. Down in my heart. Where? Down in. And then it ends. Down in my heart to stay. But have you noticed it doesn't stay you ever notice that? We ought to change the words. Down in my heart for a little while. Down in my heart till I get mad. Down in my heart till I get offended. Down in my heart till I get depressed. Down in... You can have joy one Sunday and not have joy the next. You can have joy one year and not have joy the next year. Heard about this man. You say, when you get into the Bible, I'm almost there heard about this grandfather he fell asleep and isn't it fun to have grand